Dakota South Dakota Land Owners and South Dakota's PUC proceeding really the Keystone XL and work in Nebraska with Old Nebraska and their opposition to uh, Keystone XL. And currently I represent M350 and the Sierra Club and Enbridge's and Enbridge's proposed expansion of the uh, Alberta for pipeline in northern Minnesota. And just recently authored some proposed legislation for Minnesota related to oil spill response. So um, I wanted to thank everybody for being here. One of the things that's become clear to me from working on this issue for about five years now is how confusing this law is. Um, it really is a structure that only a corporate energy lawyer could love. And that's very important. And one of the things that's really important for, for lawyers and law students to do in this kind of process is to teach people. And a lot of what I've done out in the Midwest has been a lot of teaching of, so that to assist the organizers. And frankly, I see most of my work is, is primarily assisting the organizing efforts because most of this stuff is probably not going to be one week of litigation. That could happen in specific sites, but uh, most of the law has been so jacked by the oil industry over so many decades that it's extremely difficult to um, succeed in many different places. So teaching people about what their opportunities, what their rights are, and how to handle the situation is very important. Um, Old Nebraska likes to say, all risks, no rewards. And this is a really useful message, especially with conservatives, especially with in rural areas. And I know that there's a lot of folks here who you know work perhaps in more urban settings, but you know these pipelines, these railroads have significant impact, potential for significant impacts in conservatives um, in rural areas. If, if the right kind of messaging and, and respect and outreach will work, you know, become very effective advocates um, in that opposition to these pipelines as well. See from the efforts in Nebraska. Um, and then we call this extreme oil. Like why extreme? Well, um, you know, the industry is always crying about, we've got all this great ability in the pocket, and we're doing all this great stuff on the tar sands, and this big equipment, and blah, blah, blah. And people are kind of crying to get that this is not normal oil. And um, it is extremely um, thick and dirty for the tar sands. It's extremely explosive for uh, Bakken. It's also a deep water horizon, it's extreme oil, extremely deep oil in the Gulf of Mexico, and it's extremely expensive. And I just to be clear to people that this is not our parents' oil. And, you know, this is crude oil. People, do people really think of crude oil exploding like this? This is a picture of the black again. You can see that trees, that's a thousand foot plume. And as Anthony said, 47 people got burned to death in a tsunami of napalm, essentially. This stuff is like gasoline. It's orange in color, it's not black. It's extremely explosive for a variety of reasons. You can't think this is gunky crude, the bottom crude oil, it's not gunky crude. It's, it's more like gasoline. And crude oil goes all the way from the bitumen, the thick stuff, and tar sands, to things that are like called natural gasoline. And then there's the oil price. Up in the corner there, that's the tar sands oil price. You can see it's $89, $90 a barrel for a new project um, to get it out of the ground. Uh, tar sand, or the Bakken is much behind it. So we're not going to have cheap oil. This oil is never going to be cheap it's because of all the infrastructure required to get it all the ground, all the energy, all the diesel fuel in the Bakken, all the natural gas and um, the tar sands, all the transportation costs and everything else. It's extremely expensive oil. Um, so in terms of the regulatory overview, there's, we like to break, like to break this down into prevention laws, the safety laws, the stuff that keeps the oil in the containers, and then there's the oil spill response laws, and then there's the state laws which relate more to siting and zoning. Um, and you can see some of the sites there that, that the response laws, or the, the spill response laws, oil spill uh, oil pollution act, which uh, is part of the, it's very important to say it's part of the Clean Water Act and its own separate law. Um, and I, we like to, I like to try to describe this to, to most people as the difference between a building code and a zoning and, um, and the fire department and an emergency and then the, the zoning codes. So all the federal laws related to railroad tank cars and um, uh, pipelines and oil tankers and whatever are kind of like building codes. They talk about how to build a pipeline, they talk about how to build railroad tracks, they talk about how to operate them, but they don't talk about where they should go and they also don't talk about how to respond to an oil spill. So industry will come into your communities and will say that ah, there's nothing we can do because it's all federally preempted and that's crap. Um, the truth is that, that federal safety laws apply only to the design, construction, operation, and maintenance. 
They don't relate to emergency response, and they don't relate to where, where a location or a site should be. And, and it also doesn't relate to aesthetic and economic um, uh, regulation. The common things that these have is that, like I said, they regulate that, and then it, the, they, they also all incorporate industry standards by reference. So most of the, these industries are all self-regulated in truth. The industry will get together with itself and figure out what wants the standards to be, and then they'll ship them off to FEMSA or the Federal Railroad Administration, FRA. And then they'll say, here, here are our standards, adopt them. And then, it, and then it takes FEMSA two or three years to catch up with them and to actually adopt them and incorporate them by reference. So the DOT 111 standard was set by the uh, American Railroad Association, what it's called, American Association of Railroads. And uh, the pipeline steel standards are all set by the American, American Petroleum Institute. And one of the more ironic things is that the, the uh, for pipelines, they're required to do uh, a public communications thing. And it's really, the, it's the APA, public communications, how to, how to manipulate the community. And that's all incorporated by reference to federal law. Um, this allows the industry to be self-regulated to a substantial degree. I mean, it's remarkable that really these ended, the federal regulators are almost entirely reactive and industry set themselves standards. Um, these laws all preempt state laws. Uh, the federal government wants to ensure uniform safety standards. And um, they, they, like I said, they do not regulate economic aesthetic impacts, nursery skill response or location. Um, the federal uh, safety regs for railroads, you can see some of the things that they do there. Basically, anything related to track design, railroad car design, operations maintenance, crew, passenger safety, blah, blah, blah. All that stuff is regulated by the feds. So you can see this is a picture of uh, a DOT 111s in Minneapolis. About eight oil trains currently go through Minneapolis and St. Paul every day. Uh, this is right along the um, pathway between the two campuses of, the, of Minneapolis, of the University of Minnesota, St. Minneapolis, and St. Paul for campuses. And there were about three miles of cars parked that day. Um, I drove from one end to the other. It's three miles long. I don't know how many wide, how many cars were full of cars. Um, the hazardous liquid pipeline safety is all by the Federal Hazardous Material and Safety Administration, or FEMSA. Uh, and again, they, they manage the design, construction, operation, and maintenance of pipelines. And then you can see, Ken will talk more about this in, later on, but you can see the uh, preemption language there, but also the fact that they don't regulate safety. Or, um, location. Uh, U.S. Coast Guard facility regs. Um, there, I thought these would be particularly useful for people in the Pacific Northwest because these are the regulations that um, determine how tank reports are open and tank reports is operated, maintained, designed, and whatever. And um, so there, there are also offshore platform regs, and there are other kinds of regs too for other. But these are the ones that thought would be useful. And then the federal spill response laws, this is like the fire department. You know, again, building codes don't relate to how the fire department comes and puts out the fire once the building gets poorly designed and it's on fire. And the oil spill response laws, the, the Clean Water Act was the first um, federal legislation related to the oil pollution, the oil, oil spills, passed in 72. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here, but this um, was the so the heart of the, of the oil spill response law. 1989, Congress passed the Oil Pollution Act. It amended, it included 27 of 33 U.S.C. 2701, which is separate from the Clean Water Act, but also it amended um, 33 U.S.C. 1321J related to um, the facility response plans. So. That's actually 1990. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, the president must approve all facility response plans. You've got BRPs, vessel response plans that are managed by the Coast Guard for oil tankers, and then you've got facility response plans. And the president is required to approve all these plans, and that actually has been found to trigger NEPA, but only in one case down in Texas, it's still under Walker. Um, 33, so um, where a facility causes significant and substantial harm, then it has to submit a plan to the president. The president goes goes through process to do that, and, and uh, it's actually at the present. But then anybody gets another slide here talks about that process. Um, and then facilities that don't have an approved plan can't operate. The, the EO uh, 12777 executive order divvies up all the response plan requirements between all the different agencies. And you can see here the regs that relate to different agencies. Um, 
and uh, let's see. Uh, so railroad facility response plans. 